Yeah. Okay. So, um, as I said, um, thanks very much for, for inviting us to, to the meeting to, to speak. Uh, my name is Dr. Roisin McMacken, um, and I uh, lead the TMS based research uh, of Huntington's disease and other neurological diseases um, here in Trinity College at the Academic Unit of Neurology. Um, I'm just going to give you a very informal, quick run through of uh, who we are, uh, what we're trying to do, and, and what TMS is, and uh, and what we hope to achieve. And I'm happy to to take any questions at the end uh, if if we haven't covered it between myself and and Colm, who will speak after after I do. Um, so just to to start off, um, we work at the Academic Unit of Neurology in Trinity College in Dublin. So we're led by Professor Orla Hardiman, who's a consultant neurologist in. Uh, in Beaumont Hospital, there's a picture of her down there on the, the bottom right hand side. Um, and we work on tackling neurological diseases from many different angles. So we have a, a psychology subsection that looks at cognition and behavior. We have a genetic subsection uh, to look at changes in genes. We have uh, a brain function testing subgroup, uh, which we call the physiology subgroup. Um, and we have um, uh, we're working on trying to increase the number of clinical trials for various neurological illnesses in Ireland. Um, and, and that's um, in conjunction with the, the clinical team that Professor Hardiman leads in, in Beaumont Hospital. Um, currently, we, so we have been primarily researching motor neuron disease, and we're looking at expanding that into Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, and frontotemporal dementia. Um, all of which are different diseases uh, which, which affect the brain. Uh, so I work in the brain function testing subgroup of our team um, or the, the physiology subgroup. Um, so this is me. Um, so I, uh, as, as Ashley said, uh, I'm a neuroscientist and I have a PhD in clinical medicine. And what I did for my PhD was looked at testing uh, brain function measurements uh, to see if I could predict how each person who had motor neuron disease would be affected in terms of their movement and their cognition and their behavioral changes um, and how each individual would be affected because a big problem with motor neuron disease is that each individual um, has very unpredictable symptoms. Everybody's very different in how they're affected and how severely they're affected. And um, this was quite a, a successful PhD and, and we found lots of interesting things that we're, we're trying to bring now towards being used in the hospitals. So um, we just thought we should expand this, um, this research to other diseases. And uh, in the case of Huntington's disease, uh, we think this could be quite useful because Huntington's disease is another disease, as, as you'll all know, that affects movement and cognition and behavior, and, and is also quite unpredictable in terms of how each individual will be affected uh, by the disease. So, um, I won this award um, from the Brain Box Initiative, who are a company in Wales that supports this kind of research, um, to help me uh, collect some what we call uh, pilot data. So some, some data to prove that this, uh, this type of approach would be useful in Huntington's disease. Um, and hopefully then that will enable us to expand the project into a much bigger scale uh, set of, of, of physiology research in Huntington's disease. Um, and I actually have uh, a bit of a connection to, to Belfast, as I'm co-advised by um, Professor Richard Carson, who is in Queen's University, Belfast, and he's an expert in TMS. So he's been mentoring me the whole time. And I've been up and back uh, sometimes to, to Belfast to help them and they help me. Um, so, we're, uh, so we'd be delighted uh, if there was more interest from uh, Northern Irish participants in, uh, in this research. So I don't want to get to be overly simple or overly complicated, but just for some brief context. Um, if, um, so, so obviously Huntington's disease affects the brain. And what we know to be the most uh, severely affected area of the brain in Huntington's disease is this group of structures that are right deep in the brain called the basal ganglia. So they're highlighted in orange here at the very center of the brain. Um, and we know that the, that the basal ganglia are important for movement and cognition and behavior. So it's obviously that's why, um, because this structure is affected, this causes these problems in Huntington's disease. 
But if I just put on top of this a map of all the, the, the connections in the brain, you can see, so the basal ganglia just, doesn't just act by itself, but all the cells in the brain are really highly interconnected. And it's by talking to one another that they do what they're supposed to do. They don't just act on their own. Um, so you can, um, you can see all these lines represent all the, some, most of the connections in the brain, but probably not even all of them. And you can see that where the basal ganglia is in the middle of the brain, there's all these connections to the very front of the brain, which we call the prefrontal cortex. And those are areas involved in, in cognition and behavior. Um, and just to, to, because cognition is sort of a, a term that we throw about a lot, but um, sometimes it's hard to sort of wrap your head around. When I say cognition, I mean all those higher mechanisms that we have, which enable us to override our reflexive or habitual behaviors to produce behaviors according to our own intentions and wishes. So things, so cognition includes things like attention to, to, to relevant things and uh, inhibiting inappropriate behaviors and, um, it, and being able to, to concentrate and think about what we're interested in. And so we have all these connections to the areas involved in cognition and we have all these other connections. So these, these connections reach up to the areas involved in movement. Um, so there's loads and loads of connections between the, this deep structure and the area of the brain that we, we use in order to tell our body uh, to move the way we want it to. So um, what we want to know is um, what way does Huntington's affect these connections between the movement areas and the cognitive areas and the behavioral areas of the brain? Because it's those connections which regulate um, how, how well we can, we can do these things, but also how not well we can do them if they're affected in disease. So if we can better understand how Huntington's disease is affecting these connections, we can better understand the disease and then we can better tailor our approaches to developing new therapies. We also want to know how the changes in these connections relate to the symptoms in each individual. Because ideally, if we know that there's some specific changes in these connections will predict what symptoms someone will get or how severe they are, then ideally in future, what we could do is measure these connections early on and predict how each individual will be affected. And of course, that's not only um, very important for, for those affected and their caregivers in terms of knowing what to expect and how to manage the symptoms, but also if we have some way of predicting the disease and how it will, how it will progress, then we can um, detect the, the, the presence of the disease earlier. And then when we're using it, uh, when we're testing drugs in clinical trials, we'll have something that we can, we can use to measure if the drugs are working even before the symptoms have started. Um, so that's um, sort of a, a very brief synopsis of why we're doing this research. Um, and so I mentioned TMS, um, and TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. And that's the tool that we're, one of the tools that we use to study brain function um, and the one I'll be using for this pilot study. And it's been used in motor neuron disease a lot, uh, very successfully to, to measure um, changes in the brain. So I'm interested in, in, in broadening that out to look at um, measuring the connections in Huntington's disease. And um, so it sounds very scary, but it's really not. Um, so I have a picture on the right hand side here of somebody getting TMS. So the person sitting down just needs to relax and not do anything at all. Um, and then this guy here is, is applying the TMS. So we have these plastic covered coils and they uh, basically generate magnetic pulses which are applied to the head over the cells we're interested in. And that causes them to, to activate. And then we measure how well they function based on how well they can activate a muscle in the hand when we just measure that using sticky pads over the thumb. So it's quite an easy um, thing for somebody to take part in. There's no electric shocks or static shocks because we use magnets rather than electricity. Um, and, uh, and from this, we can gain a lot of information about how, how normally or abnormally um, connections in the brain are, are working uh, with people who do and don't have Huntington's disease. I just want to highlight that some people will have heard of TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation in the context of what we call OR TMS or repetitive TMS. Just if you're going to Google TMS or look into it, OR TMS is a different type of procedure that's used. It's being investigated 
um, in clinical trials as therapies for things like multiple sclerosis and depression. But I just want to highlight that's not what I'm doing here. So this is not a clinical trial. This is a, a research study. So we don't expect what we're doing to have any therapeutic effects. It's just to measure the brain and understand the, the, the disease. So um, I'm hoping to start this, uh, this uh, study in Huntington's disease later this summer. Um, and we're going to, to be looking to take measurements in those um, diagnosed with Huntington's disease, as well as uh, any family members of people with Huntington's disease. Um, they can be related or unrelated. They can have a known genetic status or don't know, or it doesn't matter in terms of the genetics. Um, they just have to be 18 year olds or over, so they're adults. There's no upper age limit. And we do this in St. James's Hospital in Dublin. So it's just uh, right near Houston Station in Dublin, or you can get the Belfast uh, Enterprise to Connolly and then get the Red Line Lewis up. Um, and then we do the study for about two and a half hours, uh, Monday to Friday, because we can't access the, the facility in the hospital on the weekend. But it is a, it's a dedicated research facility. It's not on the wards or near sick people or anything. And we have loads of um, COVID procedures in place, additional procedures to ensure we, we are keeping everything hygienic and, and safe at the moment. So um, if you'd like to get involved or even just kind of ask questions or hear more about it uh, beyond uh, what I can talk about today, just feel free to send me an email or you can text or call or WhatsApp me on, on this number here down the bottom, um, and I'll be happy to, to um, help you get involved or answer any questions you have. Um, and also feel free to answer or to ask me any questions uh, once I, uh, I guess once Colin's finished in case he answers them first. So I'll stop sharing now. That's very welcome, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm going to follow on from, from Roisin and uh, thank you very much Ashley for the introduction and Roisin for talking about the, the group at large uh, and thank you everyone on the call for, for allowing us to speak today. Uh, but as Roisin and Ashley said, I'm, I'm Colin and I'm a first year PhD candidate looking at thinking and behavioural changes in Huntington's disease. And I work in the same group as Roisin uh, in the Academic Unit of Neurology in Trinity College under Professor Hardiman. Uh, but I'm going to follow on from what Roisin said uh, and tell you a little bit more about HD research being done in Beaumont, uh, Beaumont Hospital in Dublin and Trinity College. Oh, one sec. Yeah. yeah, so like I said, I'm in the first year of my PhD uh, and though myself and Roisin are in the same group, the difference is that my PhD is in neuropsychology. Uh, and neuropsychology is basically just the study of how changes in the brain because of illness or injury uh, can impact people's thinking and behaviour. And I came into this from a background in psychology and science, and I have a master's in clinical neuroscience from Queen's Square in London, UCL. Uh, and I got interested in, in Huntington's disease and uh, movement disorders in, uh, in London, primarily because I was working with uh, this gentleman, who is Professor Ed Wilde. Uh, and some of you might know him from his research in tracking disease processes in Huntington's for clinical drug trials, uh, and maybe from HD Buzz as well, which I'm sure many of you are, uh, know well. Uh, but I came back to psychology and back to Dublin, <laughs> and now I'm working under this man, who's Professor Niall Pender, who again you might know uh, as a familiar face in Huntington's research uh, and clinical neuropsychology in Ireland. Uh, and our focus basically is looking at how thinking and behaviour can change in some people with Huntington's disease and also how HD might affect other family members who don't have the gene. Uh, and so there's a team of researchers uh, who I work with on these projects in Bonham. And that includes two other research assistants uh, and another PhD researcher who's Dr. Sarah Darcy. Uh, and Roisin already covered some of the basics of what causes thinking and behavior changes in uh, Huntington's. Uh, but basically, as you said, it's changes in this movement center deep in the brain, the, the basal ganglia or the striatum, which you might know it as, as well. And, uh, and this can interfere with other networks in the brain. Uh, and the reason the thinking and behavioral changes can happen, it's likely due to interference in the networks from the, the movement centers to the frontal lobes. Uh, and the pathways that flow from there to the front are known as the frontal striatal networks. Uh, and this, in, this in, can interfere with a person's thinking or Cognition, like Roisin explained, uh, like our ability to plan, recognize emotion, and pay attention. 
Uh, and these changes can sometimes be seen even before diagnosis, but they don't happen in everyone and they can be different in anyone who does have these kind of changes. And so even though there's this one gene which causes Huntington's, the fact that it affects kind of people differently um, means that there are hints that there could be other uh, different things influencing these symptoms. And we want to understand why this is uh, by looking for these differences in the thinking or cognition and behavior and search within these groups for potential modifier genes or the gen genetic influences or environmental influences. Uh, so why are, are we looking at thinking changes in HC? Well, basically there, there are 700 people in Ireland who have motor manifest uh, HD and studies like ours hasn't really been done in Ireland before. And so though it's well known that these changes can sometimes happen before the motor onset, the specific types of thinking changes aren't very well understood and they can vary a lot. So I'm hoping to, to understand a little bit about why this is and look at factors that might influence whether or not someone with HD might experience thinking changes. And so because there's no cure for HD yet, there are many uh, research groups running clinical trials to, to, to work on developing effective treatments. Uh, and I'm sure you all heard about the, the very disappointing news of the Roach and Wave Life Sciences uh, drug trials recently ending. Uh, but the efforts are still continuing to find treatments. And, and it's very important that we have sensitive and specific tools for looking at cognition, these thinking changes early on in HD. Uh, so by identifying these cognitive biomarkers or key changes in thinking, which we can measure and uh, using these to track thinking changes in clinical drug trials will help us make sure that any drug treatments don't just work on the motor symptoms, but also uh, help the cognitive and behavioral symptoms. And also understanding these symptoms better in Ireland will help us support those affected, the people who, who do experience these changes and help them understand what to expect and to better deal with any of these changes. And we want to learn more about how these symptoms affect the caregivers and other HD family members, where more understanding will help us kind of reduce the, the strain that caregivers can sometimes experience uh, and improve their well-being in, in the future. And so the main study that uh, we're talking about today and is the main study in my PhD project is uh, HD cognition. And the reasons we're doing this uh, study is, is a lot of what I've mentioned before. It's to better understand thinking changes in Huntington's, to look at areas of thinking or areas of cognition that haven't really been looked at before uh, and uh, look at them more in depth uh, and also to improve access to clinical trials uh, earlier in, in the disease course, before people start to have symptoms by looking at these cognitive biomarkers. And similar to what Roisin was saying, that if we identify those patterns in the brain, the, those pathways by using the TMS that are impaired, we can use these uh, to, in clinical trials to, to understand how a treatment might work. And as well, we want to better understand the needs and experiences of HD patients, their caregivers, and their older HD family members to, to put some systems in place to support these people better. And we're examining this, we're looking at this uh, by using what's called neuropsychological assessment. And that's basically just a fancy way for saying that we'll do these tasks or tests that will help us look at attention or memory or mental flexibility and other things like that. Uh, and they're online now due to COVID, we've worked very hard to, to transition these to online. And the, the assessment takes about two and a half hours in total, and it'll be done over a video call uh, like this one, so we can talk face to face to show pictures and ask questions and things like that. Uh, and another part of it is there's a, an online questionnaire, which takes about 20 minutes to do, uh, and looks at more of the, pa the participants' experiences uh, and mental health and other, uh, other factors like that. And so uh, anyone can participate in this research, any HD family member, whether or not they have the gene, uh, and spouses and caregivers are HD patients as well. And also we're looking for some non-HD family member, what's called control uh, participants. And it's very important that we compare uh, scores from uh, other HD uh, participants to the general population, people without HD, to examine these changes and see if there's any, any particular differences. Another project that some of you might know about 
uh, that's active in Beaumont Hospital is the Enroll HD study. And now this is a global, worldwide, multi-site perspective observational study of HD patients and their families. And that basically means that Enroll HD hopes to understand all aspects of HD in the world globally as it happens to help inform on clinical trial development and best clinical practices in caring for patients uh, and families affected by HD. And that's been going on since about 2012. Uh, and at the minute, there's over 20,000 participants uh, actively participating in over 180 sites in 21 countries. And like I said, one of these uh, sites is in Beaumont Hospital. And we actually have some participants from Northern Ireland already enrolled in uh, enroll. So the participants uh, attend every year and this helps us look at changes over time. And at each of these annual visits, patients complete a multidisciplinary research assessment to monitor and track key changes. And so basically this multidisciplinary assessment, it, it looks at participants' movement, thinking, and their behavioral status. So it's looking at the whole HD picture. Uh, and just to give you an idea of what uh, each visit looks like, there's four main parts. So uh, the first one we'll go to is the neurological assessment. And this is done by uh, doctors in the, the clinic who assess participants' movements just by doing some brief uh, motor tests. There's also a cognitive assessment, which is a thinking, thinking tasks. So kind of brief assessments, like I mentioned before, but uh, very condensed and shorter tests. The third one there is the behavioral assessment where participants will do an interview uh, and do some questionnaires with Professor Niall Pender, who I mentioned at the start. Uh, and, and that will check in on their, the experiences they've had in the last year, check in on their mental health and, and other things like that. And the last part uh, is, is optional. They can, uh, participants give a blood sample and that's sent off for uh, big analyses where they look at different, uh, different uh, processes that can happen in the blood or different markers that happen in the blood to see if they can figure out uh, what's going on. Uh, and at the first visit, it also includes a genetic test and a clinical interview with, uh, with Prof Pender just about their background and experiences. Uh, and just to flag as well, the, uh, though there is a genetic test, um, none of the genetic, genetic information is known by any of the research staff in Beaumont. It's sent off anonymously and we never see the results. And also the, the participants never learn the results through this. So it's purely for research purposes only and it's completely anonymous. Uh, but each visit takes about two hours. Uh, and, and there's the, the website there in the bottom corner you can see is there, the enrollhd.org forward slash participate where you can learn more information about it. But basically, oh, sorry, I'm not going the wrong way. But basically any family member um, affected by HD can take part in this. Uh, and there's, the, the only limitations are age basically, is that anyone 18 or over, and you can have any genetic status or none. Uh, like I said, any member of a, a HD family. Uh, and as the enroll also it includes a brief cognitive assessment, you can see in number two there. But the HD cognition project that I mentioned before is complementary to this. So it looks at key aspects of thinking more in depth. Uh, and often people participate in both enroll and HD cognition uh, for this reason. So it's a possibility if anybody is interested or anybody would like to participate, you can do either or both. It's totally up to you. But basically, all of this is being done to improve access to clinical trials for HD patients in Ireland. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention the Family Matters campaign and uh, I see Ashley smiling there. I, I think you'll probably know about this through the HDNI and it's basically just launched in Ireland uh, across Ireland and the UK. Uh, and I was involved in helping shape some of these questionnaires initially through the HDNI in Ireland. And though I'm not directly involved anymore, I'd really encourage you to take a look at this and contribute in any way you can. I think it's a brilliant campaign and it'll really provide some really valuable insights into the lives of people touched by HD, which often we, we don't hear about a lot and especially not outside the HD community. So it's a really good awareness campaign. Uh, but I'd especially encourage you for yourselves to look at the living history wall. Uh, this is basically where people in the HD community can, can uh, share their experiences, what it's been like to live with HD and reflect on the good and the more difficult sides of it. 
Uh, it's a really lovely campaign and it gives you an opportunity to contribute your own experience on raising awareness for HD. So I really would encourage you to check that out there, but uh, the link you can see hdfamilymatters.com. So I, I realized that was a lot of uh, information there. Uh, <laughs> so if you have any questions now, I think we'll have some time to, to chat to you about those. Uh, but if you're interested in, in learning more about these studies and don't want to ask questions now, or you're interested in getting in touch for any other reason or, or interested in participating, uh, you can send me an email at the address there. It's cplo at tcd.ie, or you can give me a text or a phone call on the, the number below.